to the far reaches of space. But something's different now. <laughs> this is the end, my friend. What up, world? We're back, all the smoke. Uh, ATL, man, second day in ATL has been a movie, man. We just been knocking show out after show out. Been all cooking. classes, right? Been cooking. All classes. It's only right that we end this trip on a crazy note, man. King of Pla the South. Plan on learning a lot of new words today, y'all know. <laughs> on this show, if somebody uses a word that I don't understand, I'll ask what the definition is, because you only know if you ask. Uh, but we got my brother, man. We've been locked in for a minute, way since 925. Uh, somebody that's always shown me love since I've been in the city, and somebody I, I really look up to, uh, my brother T.I.P. in the building. King What's going on, King? Welcome to All The Smoke, my brother. Man, love and respect. Appreciate y'all for having me. Man, thanks for coming. Yeah. Man, let's get straight to it, man. Um, just opened Trap Cafe. Um, let's talk about that, because I know I got to pull up there and, and enjoy <laughs> some of the comedians and the good foods you got going. Just tell them about the vibe. Right on. Man, Trap City Cafe, just a place for us, you know what I'm saying, just to vibe at, eat, drink, smoke hookahs enjoy, you know, I'm trying to enhance the human experience. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know what I'm saying, with phones in everybody's hands, social media, everybody kind of like really, you know, living life through the lens of, of a device. And ain't nobody really putting that shit down to connect with one another right. anymore. So I'm trying to, you know, just trying to just do something to encourage that. Life, house, family, and life. Uh, we all know you big on family. And, uh, you know, how's life and family right now? What new projects you got going on? Um, man, family's great. Family great. Kids are good. Uh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed beyond measure. Um, projects. Uh, got a, a film, Fear, mm -hmm. coming out oh, on the 27th. Yeah, Deion Taylor. Yeah, yeah, Deion Taylor. Yeah, so got it. yeah, Terrence J., Joseph Sakura, um, Ruby, Annie, uh, you got King Batch. Um, just a host of us. A host of us did all. And the, the, the phenomenal part about the story, is we all kind of came together and invested in the film. So like we we mm -hmm. we collectively became producers of nice. the film as well. Mm -hmm. Um I want to talk about uh the trap. Okay. So a lot of people don't <laughs> understand said, okay. <laughs> what trap is. A lot of people um learn the we trap. We talk about the trap or trap music. I'm, so I'm so I'm finna tell you. So the word trap. So a lot of people confused about the trap because it became commercial. Right. So people, because a lot of people ain't really from the trap, right. don't know where the word trap started. So could you help explain trap and trap music, the difference between trap and trap music? Um, man, the term trap to me, you know, it was just just passed down kind of from generation to generation. Um, I think the first time I heard it in music was when Big Boy used it from Outkast, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, and, and basically the trap is, is a drug dealer's place of business, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, could be considered a double entendre because, you know what I'm saying, essentially the lifestyle is a trap. Right. Um, but it's really where, oh, and, and of course, some of the most prominent hustlers would like to consider it the place where they trap the money. Mm -hmm. Um, but trap music is... Pretty much philosophical presentation set the music, uh, outlining in detail in the life, lifestyle, and experiences of a drug dealer or mm -hmm. former drug dealer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And trap music, it's the 20th anniversary uh, this year of trap music. And it would not have sustained and, and, and just had the longevity that it's had if it were not so many people in this country or in the world that have a similar experience. Mm -hmm. If there was no war on drugs, there was no crack, no crack era, then there would be no need for trap music. Right. But because of that, we are all refugees to the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. Some way, shape, form, or fashion. 
each and every last one of us in the country got somebody either was selling dope, smoking dope, mm -hmm. went to jail for dope, died over dope, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So we all uh, have a common experience and trap music let everybody know that they ain't going through it alone. Mm -hmm. I've been here since 2003, so I was still, I was living on the west side when it was still Bank at Holloway, mm -hmm. Highway. Okay. You know, it's, it's changed now to Hollowell now. You know, mm -hmm. I've been there a while. Uh, let's talk about your childhood on the west side okay. uh, of Atlanta. Man, uh, just a little badass, nappy head, <laughs> light skin boy. You know what I'm saying? I ain't really. I mean, man, I was very smart and, and you know, uh, always uh, just inquisitive, always getting into shit unnecessarily, but very smart, like in school with academics and stuff. And a lot of people always ask, like, why? Can you be so smart and then get in so much trouble at the same time? And I think that that was, the two became tethered together probably in kindergarten, third grade, when, you know, when I'm kind of small compared to other people <laughs> in the class and shit, you know what I'm saying? Light skin, come to school, fresh every day. And when the teacher called on me to read, I read fluently. Mm -hmm. So you know, there was a lot of hate from that. So I had two choices. I could either pretend to be not as smart, so, you know. Dumb it down. Was, yeah, dumb it down. <laughs> or I could show these motherfuckers that I'm just as smart and get in just as much trouble as y'all. Mm -hmm. And I chose the latter. You know what I mean? So it can, both of, both of the, my intellect and uh, my troublesome nature kind of grew at the same rate of speed. Mm. Mm. You got a deep history of in investing in real estate out here, and it seems like a lot of artists do that out here. Where does that mindset come from? Hmm. I mean, it's hard to say. I think maybe, maybe all the examples that we've had, you know what I'm saying, before us, um, the hustlers that came before us, before there were, you know, rappers, entertainers, so on and so forth, you know, there were always people where there were number runners, you know what I mean? People selling weed out of envelopes, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? It were people who, you know, figured out a way to subsidize their own lifestyle, you know, uh, outside of the government, mm -hmm. you feel me? And, and, and with those funds, uh, the diversification of the portfolio, we just watch what the people before us did. You know, before, before there was a T.I., buying property over here. It was a cue ball, you know what I'm saying? Buying up all the property. There was a cherry, there was a nappy, there mm -hmm. was, you know, just so many OG that we saw. And the, the, the natural transition or the natural progression is when you get a certain amount of, of wealth that you've attained, don't just let it sit there until you spend it till it's gone. Mm -hmm. Don't just let it sit in the bank. Let it work Let the you. white folk trade on your money and make money and don't give you but a pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Take that money and put it into something that they ain't never making no more of dirt. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, I really learned from, I, I learned from the examples that were set forth. Don't you have, uh, I'm, I'm hearing something in the streets that you did, um, either it's Google or a big company just bought it, one of your properties mm -mm. and building something on it? I ain't sold none of my properties. Uh, but what we what we do have, and I believe micro, Microsoft is coming. Yeah. And they bought Overlook, Overlook Atlanta. I did not uh, actually own Overlook Atlanta. Okay, okay. I would have loved to have participated yeah. in that, <laughs> in, that yeah. in that acquisition, some kind of way, shape, form, or fashion. But now, nah, yeah. bro, uh, a little further down the street, um, I purchased a piece of land. I think in '15, used to be a Kmart in the grocery store, about eight and a half, nine acres. And I had the pleasure of sitting on the, the, the mayor's transition team, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. And when I did that, it kind of put me at the table with a lot of heavy developers and, and you know, real entrepreneurs, real uh, uh, people who run CEOs of corporations, like the CEO of Delta. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? People like uh, the legendary Noel Khalil from Columbia, Developments, God rest his soul. Mm -hmm. And so me and Killer Mike, we sitting here, and we all, you know, we we students. We I, we considered it an internship, if you will, and we learned the initiative of the city. Like one of the real priorities of the city was affordable housing. 
because close to 90% of the people who work in Atlanta can no longer afford to live mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Um, and I had an idea with the property to probably do something entertainment driven, bowling alley, skating ring, you know what I'm saying? Something like that. But when I sat on that transition team and learned of the city's initiatives, I said, well, maybe this could be utilized for something that could be more beneficial to the community at large. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the vision we kind of developed together, uh, me and my team, and the city supported it. And, you know, we just, created the cap, the, the, the cap table. Mm -hmm. And we should be cutting the ribbon later this year. So That's you, so you did rest. apartments over there? Yeah, yeah, mixed use, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, How many units? Because that's a big spot I, I drove by there, yeah. Yeah, 143 units, mm -hmm. yep, yep. Um, you know, with community center, uh, community garden, um, got retail space. It's a food desert in the area, so what we would love to do is find us a tenant uh, for a supermarket, for fresh produce mm -hmm. and, and so forth, fresh vegetables for, for the community to uh, reap the benefits. Uh, and also a drugstore. We need a drugstore over there for elderly to fill their prescription. We also need uh, a banking station. All the banks moved out. You know what I mean? Uh, and now that people like Microsoft are coming back, now that, you know, we got, it's clear to see that there's some money over here. Yeah. So we need the supply you know, mm -hmm. the community mm -hmm. with the amenities that it deserves. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to do what I can. Mm. That's a beautiful thing. What was the music scene like growing up out here as a kid? And, 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 and when did music really come into play for us as a passion for you? Mm. As a kid, music, uh, let me see. Well, first of all, man, Atlanta has always been like just a super, like a hotbed for talent, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, like for instance, Jane Brown from Augusta, but the first place he coming is, is Atlanta. You know, mm -hmm. if you from Augusta, the first place you coming to, to really, you know what I'm saying, do your thing on a, on a grand scale is Atlanta. Uh, Otis Redden, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You know, you just got so much talent. Brick, uh, the group Brick. Um, so many different people, man, came, came from the city. But when I was a kid, it was all about uh, Sammy Sam, uh, Kilo Ali. Kilo. Yeah. Uh, MC Shadi. Um, a damn shame. Uh, Ghetto Mafia. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, just to name a few. And, and they opened the doors for, you know, uh, future legends at the time, like Outkast and Goody Mob. Yeah. You know, I like to look at it as, I say that Kilo and Sammy Sam crawled. So Outkast and Goody Mob could walk. Mm -hmm. So Tip, Jeezy, and Gucci could run. Mm -hmm. So the future, Thug, and Lil Baby could fly. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's all integral. It all worked together. The, the doors that were opened by Shadi, Kilo, and Sammy Sam are the doors that benefited Outkast and Goody Mob. The mm -hmm. doors Outkast and Goody Mob opened are the doors that benefited me and you know the rest, and the doors that we open are the doors that benefit, that's benefiting the, the generation of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just that's just a natural evolution. At what age did music? Did you start taking music serious? As a you knew I can make I can make this a career. Taking it serious, okay, okay. So the first song I ever ever memorized and just like knew in my head and could rap word for word was 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 LL Cool J. I'm bad. <laughs> So it came out in like 85, so I was like four, five years old at the time, right? So uh, all my older, my older sisters, cousins, my uncles, you know, they'd be like, hey, Tip, come do that thing you do. You know what I'm saying? So I, oh, nobody can rap quite like I can. I take a muscle-bound man, put it face in the sand. So I'd do that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And I just saw the reaction that it got from everybody. It was like, you know what I'm saying? I was kind of like, okay, I'm digging this. And, and, and there was a... Uh, I was in school, third grade. I was getting in trouble, getting in trouble all week in school. And my uncle told me, if I hear from that school again, I'm going to whoop your ass. So <laughs> we, had, <laughs> we had a standardized test, you know what I mean? And I always finish the test early. But when I finish the test early, I'm throwing paper in, you know what I mean? Getting into other shit. <laughs> but I knew I had an ass whipping on the line. Mm -hmm. So I had to think of how I was going to, like, you know what I'm saying, occupy my time. 
So I just challenged myself to see if I could write my own rap by the time it took everybody else to finish the test. Mm -hmm. So by the time they finished the test at the cafeteria table, I did the rap. And everybody was like, ooh, no, nah, you did that? I said, yeah, I did that. Do another one. So then that night, I wrote another one. Came back, playground. Killed their ass again. What mm -hmm. age is this? This is eight. Uh, early. Yeah, they're about eight years old. I wasn't talking about shit, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he was talking, though. <laughs> I was just putting word together, yeah, you right, know what I mean? Right, And it wasn't, um, I will say, though, it, it, you know, that, but that's when I found my thing. I mean, at eight years old, I knew this is what I can do that not many motherfuckers around me are able to do the way I can. Um... But it wasn't until Criss Cross came out. Criss Cross, ABC, Illegal. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't until they came out that I said, oh, wait a minute, I ain't got to wait till I'm grown. Mm -hmm. I can do this shit now. I found out Criss Cross was discovered in the mall by Jermaine Dupri, became superstar. I said, man, I'm in the mall every week. <laughs> <laughs> the fuck is wrong with it? Where am I? You know? So that was my plan, man. You know what I'm saying? To just kind of, you know, to to present my talent to the world and, and you know, share my art and, and speak my truth. That was ever since probably 12, 13. What, 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 at what point did you, cut, you feel like you caught a break and, and got, really got your first opportunity? Man, shit, that wasn't until 1920. I was 18, 19, something like that. So um, quite naturally, as a kid, man, 12, 13, 14 years old, you working at something, working at something, working at something, you know, going from this group of producers, these managers, to traveling to New York and, you know, shopping your demo with this label, this label, this opportunity, you know, people saying, yeah, man, I think I can get us in. I think I can. And then, you know, just rejection after rejection after rejection. You know, I kind of got discouraged, and that's kind of when I, you know, just jumped head first into the streets. Mm-hmm probably around 14, what, 13, 14, 15, kind of like, man, the rap shit ain't gonna work. Mm -hmm. You know, we might try out. something else, you know what I mean? And then I started, you know, uh, becoming introduced to people like Master P, you know what I mean? Started researching, like, rap a lot, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Started, you know, seeing how people who didn't get signed by majors, how they, you know, manifested their own destiny. Mm -hmm and became the architects of they, you know what I'm saying, of they, of they future. And um, so that's what we did, man. Me and, me and a group of homeboys, we just, we just hustled and hustled and hustled and used the money every week that we hustled on Sunday to go to the studio. Mm -hmm. And shit, that's, you know, we kind of worked that move until, it had, until we made it. Two questions. Um... What is your writing process like now? Like, do you freestyle and punch? And second question is, or do you write down? Second question is, what's your studio must have? Like, what you gotta have in the studio to make that, make that hit? Man, okay. My writing process is, you know, it it it, it differs case mm -hmm. by case. Depends on the type of song I'm writing. The vibe. Yeah, depends on the type of song I'm writing. If I'm writing a song like. Uh, like live your life, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Where it's thought, there's a lot of thought into it, and you, you know what I'm saying? You really gotta kind of put your word, choose your words carefully. I might like, you know, use my notes. I might even put pen to paper. Or if I know I'm in, I'm going in with a dog. Mm -hmm. If I know I'm going in with a dog, like uh, me and Currency just did a record together. Me, Currency, and JD. I knew he wasn't finna be bullshit, you hear me? <laughs> I already knew I got to go, I got to come in here, you know what I'm saying, on my A game. So that was a little bit different. Whereas he, if I got records like... Pink. Hmm? The one you did with Pink was crazy. Did y'all... Oh, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that motherfucker came to me. I was going through something at the time. You know <laughs> hey, I had it on my mind. That's a record, though. Hey, man, look, let me tell you something, man. You talking about Juicy, right? Huh? Tell me no, about the one with Juicy. No, 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 the, the, the slow one you got with Pink. Uh, Shoulda known that oh, from shit, the start. Oh, shit, you going way back. Come on, man. I don't even remember what the process was like at that, at that <laughs> moment in time, man. There's yeah. no telling. Yeah, that's like three albums ago. I mean, let me see. Probably four. Mm-hmm. Probably long four. Long. Five. I think that was my last album on Atlantic. Mm-hmm. That probably about four or five mm -hmm. albums. That should, actually should have been a single. Yeah, yeah, that was a classic. Favorite producer to work with in doing your career early on? 
Man, I got to say DJ Toon. Mm -hmm. DJ Toon was the first, you know, a lit producer, really the first person who had ever been in the music industry, you know, present day, that, that saw me and took a liking and took a chance mm -hmm. on me and, uh, and my talent. Um, of course, you know, over time, you know what I'm saying, we, we our work ethic kind of changed um, as far as us working together. A lot of time the business got in the way, a lot of stuff. It's just a lot of stuff, it's, but we will always remain brothers. Mm -hmm. I love Tumpa, I give, you know, I give whatever I can for him. And he will do the same for me. Right. Uh, and we created classics together, like real bona fide classics. That's my Dr. Dre. I'm his Snoop Dogg. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Nah, for real. Um, but after, well, I ain't gonna say but, uh, in, 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 in included to that afterwards, Pharrell became the next A-list producer that kind of really took a chance and invested and, in, you know what I mean? Like really, really poured energy, information, and, and his efforts into, mm -hmm. into what I had going on. Then after that, you had people like Just Blaze, mm -hmm. um, Scott Storch. Um, man, there's so many. It's so many. I don't even want to get here just trying to, you know, create a list. I'll leave somebody off. Yeah, shout out Jazzy. You got oh, Jazzy Faye. Goddamn. Yeah. See you how you, you see what you did there? Man, come on. You know you I see? know, man. You know I know, man. You got some classes with Jazzy. Man, man. hell yeah. What's one of your favorite cities to perform in besides the A? Man, I like to go overseas, man. Because mm -hmm. uh, the Africa, bags. Africa will fight. The bags different over there, too. I mean, yeah, the money's the money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm talking about the energy from the crowd, though. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, Kenya. We did a show in Kenya, mm. Nairobi, if I ain't mistaken. Mm -hmm. Man, it was just lit. We did a show in Tanzania. Like, man, at least 100,000 people, far as the eye could see. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just a different energy. You could tell that, you know, they appreciated the moment. You know what I mean? It went like, ah oh, man, yeah, he hit that money. It's gonna be another motherfucker hit that money, and another motherfucker hit the money after that. So, you know, it felt special. It just feel, it, you know what I mean? It feel different. And um, Jamaica, Jamaica was dope. Mm -hmm. You know. Make a make a. Yeah, performing that song uh, with uh, I'm Serious mm -hmm. with Beanie Man mm -hmm. in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. That's on level. Yeah. Um, I'm Serious, Trap Music, Urban Legend was my, one of my all-time favorite albums. King, Paper Trail, all two times platinum. What out of those, do you have a favorite out of those? Man, you know, I used to say when asked this question that I don't, I, I can't pick a favorite because they all like children. Mm -hmm. However, the Libra is, is my favorite now. Simply because the Libra is the only album or the first album where I got a chance to work with my, with my children. Mm. You know, we got a song on the Libra called Family Connect, yep. which features my son, Damani, Damani. Yeah. and my other son, Messiah. Uh, he produced it. You and Damani performed together recently at the Hawks game. Yeah, yeah, that's the song we performed. Yeah. Yep, yep. What's that like to to see? I mean, LeBron is on a, on a track to try to play with one of his sons in the NBA. Mm -hmm. I mean, you basically did that in, in, in your in your profession. What was it like to be side by side by your little man? Man, it's a phenomenal feeling mm -hmm. simply because even for him to take the art as serious as he does, and and for me to witness his work ethic and witness, witness his growth. Um, I remember hearing his first songs, and, and I just remember like telling him, with love, this ain't shit. You know what I mean? This is, you, got to, you got to do better than this. Mm -hmm. Because all he all was talking about was going to the mall and you know, walking out with big bags of clothes. And I said, man, these boys, they gonna beat your ass. Yeah, he ain't that now, though. <laughs> Don't nobody wanna hear about you balling in their face. You gotta find a way to relate to people. and a commonality, something that y'all have that, that brings you together. Don't mm -hmm. talk about the one thing that separates you. Right. And he took that information and he just started, he started rapping about how he felt school was 
a waste of time and mm -hmm. him wanting to go somewhere but not having a driver license and having the way to, like those are the things right. that everybody really care about. Mm -hmm. Start rapping about shit like, you know, being in a mansion on the weekends and apartments on the weekdays. Cause a lot of people they think that, you know, just because he my son that he lived with me indefinitely, mm -hmm. you know, but his mom, you know, has had, you know, majority of the time with him and it was probably, I mean, I just, with his music, it shed light on the fact that that was a pretty, it was a transition. Mm -hmm. Going from my house back to yeah. a mama house, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, but those are the things I think that that when he started speaking on those subjects, uh, speaking as a young man, expected to be in a relationship with a, with a, you know, with a girl, like, hey man, I'm not ready. You know what I mean? Those types of things, I just listen to it and respect so much. I find so much value in it. So to share a stage, share a song with them, that's, it's a phenomenal feeling. Mm -hmm. That's dope. Uh, you've won three Grammys. Um, looking back at that, where you come from, what you accomplished, what you continue to accomplish, is there one that stands out more than others uh, when it comes to those three Grammys? Mm. I mean, I think they're all, to me, um, Man, I think, you know, it's 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 an honor and, and a privilege to be acknowledged and considered uh, amongst the elite, um, amongst your peers and constituents, you know what I mean? Um, so I value all of them, collectively and individually. Um, I probably say the, the moment that, that stands out to me the Grammy moment that stands out is the Swagger Like Us performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, which we also took home some hardware right. for that that, mm -hmm. that, that year. Um, that to me was like, you know, I don't think there's been another moment like that since. That was heavy. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, that was my next question was, I mean, what was the creative process like that coming up? I mean, obviously that song is you, Yay, Jay, Wayne. Gucci. Are you guys all in the studio together sending verses? How is that working? Nah, man, I had like, you know, some um, unique conditions at the time, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that wouldn't you was tied down, huh? necessarily <laughs> allow me, you know, <laughs> to make myself available for everybody. But what happened was, okay, so... <laughs> um, so, we're working on the album, um, Paper Trail. And, you know, we have a lot of records that's, you know, bangers. We already got, like, What's Up, What's Happening. We already had records like My Life, Your Entertainment. Mm -hmm. We already had uh, Whatever You Like, you know what I'm saying? Um, at the last couple weeks of the deadline of the album, there's always like, you know, one or two that just takes the album to another level. So those two records that came in the last minute were Swagger Like Us and Live Your Life. Wow. Yeah, I mean, oh, three, three, and uh, Dead and Gone, just, uh, and just, Timberlake. just in Timberlake. Yeah. Um, those records came like in the last two weeks uh, of us wrapping the album up. And so, Initially, man, Kanye had just got me the beat when he sampled uh, M.I.A.'s Paper Planes. Yeah. You know, which was a huge, huge international hit record yep. at the time. Um, and it was just Ye, uh, excuse me, it was a, a beat produced by Ye. And I put three verses on it. And then I think G. Robeson, who was, you know, my A&R, and would later become my manager. He um, he said, oh, Ye got a verse. I said, okay, bet. So then Ye got me his verse. I took one of my verses off. And then uh, G just listened to it and said, you know what would be dope? If I could get Wayne and Jay on here. Damn. I said, man, get the fuck out of here, right. man. <laughs> I was man say, come damn. on, man, I ain't finna do that. And he was like, nah, for real, I mean, just let me work, let me work. So, you know, we held it so for for a long time. It was just me and Ye on the record, right? And in the last two weeks, we got all the verses. Mm. You know what I mean? And uh, 
that shit was just, you know, it was it was unspeakable. Magical. It was unspeakable. It was magic. You could tell, like, you know, this shit, I'm not supposed, this ain't supposed to be happening. <laughs> right. For mm-hmm. real. You know, there's the stars and the moon aligning in my favor. The universe is shining down on me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, awesome. so. The way it came together. Yeah. Obviously, you can make hits when they're sent and, 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 you, and your conditions don't allow you to move freely, when your conditions do allow you to move freely and you're able to get in the studio mm-hmm. with an artist, explain right. the difference in the energy when you're in there with somebody uh, rather than having the sample sent to you. Well, to be honest with you, man, I'm going to tell you, when I was locked, well, on House Arrest and, and working on the, like, when I did the, I guess, the, the body of the work that, that that became Paper Trail. When I did the first like 15, 16 songs, when I'm on House of Rest, that was the most thought I ever put mm. into my lyrics. Cause for one, I can't just say no why shit. I'm already, you know, on, on, I'm on a uh, supervised release. Mm-hmm. got all kinds of feds and shit, on, you know, looking mm-hmm. at me. So I gotta say what I wanna say, but be very careful in my delivery. Song, a song like What's Up, What's Happening it was very difficult to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, th- this happened when uh, I found out that, that me and Lo had some issues. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you, so the funny shit is, so Lo and I had issues because uh, he was upset that, or he, he, didn't, he didn't agree with me not getting on a song that he wanted me to get on. Mm-hmm. Um, and he felt like it should just be like, yo, I asked you to do it, just do it. I'm like, nah, but for real, I don't like the song. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, the back and forth led to, all right, well, 50,000 in. And so, you know, he, he, he kind of took that, you know, he took that to heart. And cut two, we go to Club Crucial, which is my club right. at the time, by the way. Uh, Shout a low in there, and he, he played. Bum, 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 bum. Mm. Bum, 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 Hello. They know. They, they know. know. And yeah. I see him perform that shit for the first time. And then I see him perform dun dun and all dun, dun. I say, I leave the VIP and go meet him at the stage. I say, nigga, that's it. Them the ones right there. Mm-hmm. Them the songs. And then I got there, fuck around, caught a K on House of Red and find out them fucking songs was about, about me. You. I done complimented the man on the song <laughs> <laughs> that he made about me, That's you know crazy. what I'm saying? <laughs> but I genuinely liked the motherfuckers, yeah. right? The first yeah. songs, you know, cause, I mean, I had been kind of, I guess, conditioning myself and, and, and preparing myself lyrically, create, creatively, for my moment. So, you know what I'm saying? My 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 pen and my skill, like my e- expectation of myself was just at a greater level, right? So some shit I just wasn't fucking with. Mm-hmm. And it took people like, you know, like Low and other people, it, it took them a minute to kind of like catch a stride and to get, you know, they always, Low always had the people behind him because he really, he bought what he say he bought and mm-hmm. he from where he say he from. and the whole community knows, you know? So he always had the support, but the skill set and the, 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 he had to be surrounded with the, the, the producers and it just had to, it had to grow into the moment mm-hmm. that w- w- would allow me to include myself in it. Right. Um, so when I heard those songs, I was like, he done found his pocket, you know what I mean? Uh, little did I know, them motherfucking songs was directed, <laughs> at, <laughs> was directly, directly at me. But I never took it like really personal. I never took it really personal because I understood, I understood what what, what this represented. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because uh, you 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 spend a lot of time on the west side. You understand? Bankhead is split in two sides. When you say must be two sides, yeah, it, it really is. is. It's the projects. And the back streets, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So Low is from Bourne Homes. So you got Bourne Homes, you got Bankhead Court, you mm-hmm. got, you know what I mean, like projects just on Bankhead. Oh, that's gone now. Yeah, it's gone, they didn't tow them down. <laughs> you know, they, you know, they're gonna be some nice condominiums for yeah. you. <laughs> but, um, 
people from the projects always historically have, you know, looked at people from the back streets like, yo, y'all ain't gutter for real. Y'all yeah. living in nice houses and shit. You know what I mean? You ain't got no, you know. Uh, and, and, and people in the back street like, shit, nigga, we in the same ghetto you in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just up the street. Yeah. So it is two sides. Um, but I understood what that represented, right? So I, I never took it personally. We always maintained a mutual respect for one another. Um, and we used to just talk on the phone throughout the, 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 the beef, if you mm -hmm. will. We, like, we'd talk on the phone and, and he'll say, yeah, yeah, you know, I got something for you, man. I say, man, you know, I'm gonna be ready for it whenever it get here, right? <laughs> And he say, see, see, that's why I don't like your ass. The only thing you can do that I can't do is talk. That's all you can do is talk. I say, well, if that's all it takes, why you don't learn how to talk then? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just go back and forth, exchanging wit, you know what I'm saying, banter on the phone. Uh, but I really did respect him, bro. I respect mm -hmm. him because, because he took his vision and he took the talent and capabilities and the things that he had. Never mind what he didn't. He mm -hmm. took what he had, mm -hmm. utilized it, maximized the opportunity, and turned it into some legendary shit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like, you know, of all of the beefs and skirmishes and disagreements I've been in, that was my most respectable one. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? That was the one that I really, really did respect. And I'm glad that before he passed, we got a chance to... You know, he became my neighbor. Mm -hmm. I was getting out of prison. I found out he bought the house up the street from me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm down at, uh, at, I'm working at, it's a little, so we live on a lake. Uh, and and it's a part where you can put your boat on the lake if you don't actually live and got a dock. And so it's like a little parking lot where we used to go run sprints and work out and shit. So I see him pulling in. I see another nigga, you know, like, well, who the fuck else is over here <laughs> looking like this? These West Side niggas right here, what yeah, the fuck they doing yeah. over here? And I look at my cousin and say, that's low. I say, you bullshit. So he see me, I see him, and it's like right after I got out of prison, so fresh out of whatever the, the, the beef was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I walk up to him, first thing he said, man, what's happening? Welcome home. And, you know, we dapped up, just started talking about fatherhood, talking about... Real you know, shit. Man, yeah, you shit know what I'm saying? Matter. And, and you know we was we was solid from that point forward. Mm -hmm. Mentioned a few names. You tell me the impact of Atlanta and some of the favorite projects from these people. Outcasts, man, legends like goats, icons. They are they are the pinnacle. You know what I'm saying? That's the holy grail. You did. Uh, favorite, I don't know, man. The whole discography, I'm gonna have to go yeah. with. I'm gonna go with the first one, Southern Playlist. I'm gonna just yeah, go with that. Got that to. set the tone. You know yeah. what I mean? That's for everybody. The tone. Yeah. Two Chains. Two Chain, man. That's 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 one of the most uh, prolific businessmen. Mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? He was a business man before he was a rapper. Yeah, you know, guy. I know. You know how yeah. How? On that. Man, we ain't gonna speak too much on it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, 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 bro was in the studio before he was recording in the studio. Yeah, you Max. Know? Uh, and, and again, a hustler's mentality. Took what he had, you know what I'm saying, and turned it into an empire. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, you, you can't say enough about that. That's, you know, that, that, that level of, I guess, tenacity. Mm -hmm. Should be acknowledged and, and, and held in high regard. Future. Um, present day icon. Like, he's basically taking everything that everybody else before him has done for the city and putting an exclamation on top of it, you know, and he's doing it. He's doing it impressively mm -hmm. in grand fashion with, 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 with hits, you know, with numbers. Touring, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and you know, just the, the the leadership of a whole generation. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like that shit is beautiful to see. One of this name I'm finna say. I wish I would have could have got a mixtape or something from y'all, Jeezy. Mm. Mm. Every time y'all get together, it's over with. <laughs> it's over. 
Man, Young, man, listen, man, that's my partner, right? So uh, I, I, I met Young early on before he was, he was still, uh, I, I think he called him Jay or something like Little that. Jay. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was, this was way before the snowman. Like, it was, and we have a mutual acquaintance in, in, in Big Meech. And so I knew Meech already, and, you know, we all frequent the clubs and shit together. And um, I remember sitting across the stage from them at Magic City. <laughs> before the re before the, the renovation. Yeah, way before the renovation. The little yeah. catwalk. The little catwalk yeah. came down, and that was it. So I'm sitting across from them, and, and he climbed up over on the stage, and you know what I'm saying, bring Jesus with him, say, hey, man, then my guy Jay. You know what I mean? And, you know, he he rapping, and, and I'm like, yeah, okay, another rapper. All right, good. All right, good. <laughs> You know, and he kind of took that like, shit, bro, what's up? What's it? I'm saying, man, <laughs> all right, man, I'll I, I see, we'll see what it, what it turned out to be. Uh, I was real, you know, arrogant in my, in, in my day. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up going to jail. When I got out, he had done took off with, with the mixtapes and shit. Mm -hmm with the snowman shit. Mm -hmm. And when I got out, I say, oh shit, I need to do a record with this nigga. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like this, this motherfucker shit, he got it. And I remember him, he done already told the story, so I ain't saying nothing, you know, nothing privileged. Um, I remember seeing him, meeting him in the studio after I got out. And I remember he had, you know, he had some people in there that I knew these people, I know what they on. And he had, you know, some material that I recognized. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I said, hey, man, man. <laughs> I said, bro, come here right quick, man. Listen. You gotta let one go. You can't, you can't play at this level and still play at this level mm -hmm. and expect them not to cross collateralize. You, you can't hold on to the grass and reach for the stars. Mm -hmm. You got to let one go. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the time he looked at me like shit, nigga, all right. You know, his, 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 his exact word was, shit, nigga, ain't you doing both? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I say, nah, bro. I let that shit go a long time ago. It was some hungry nights. That was my sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know, that's what I did to show the universe that I really wanted it. Um, and, and as legend tells it, you know, that conversation led to him, you know, inevitably taking the rap shit a lot more mm -hmm. serious. Mm -hmm. That's dope. Uh, last Gucci Man. Mm. Man, Gucci Man is also a legend. You can't take enough, you can't take anything away from what he represented and what he brought to the city. Um, definitely put the east side on the map. You know what I mean? He would definitely, and it was in a time where it wasn't nothing but west side action going on, you know, and he came and stood on business. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know. I mean, right or wrong, you can't take away from 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 his his contributions. Yeah, his contribution to the culture and what he meant to the city, what he means, you know, to the to the legacy of the city. For me, even uh, if we don't see eye to eye all the time, yeah, yeah, still yeah, still got to you know, still got to acknowledge the contributions that were made to the culture because that benefits the city as a whole. A lot of artists, our contributions collectively and individually. It's all for what's best for Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, 2006, you started acting, ATL. Mm. What was the process in that? And, how, and what made you interested in, to, and it make you interested in acting? Man, just to be honest with you, bro. Again, watching people who had came before me, LL Cool J, Ice Cube, Tupac, Ice T, you know what I mean? It's a natural evolution if you're doing this at a, a you know, at a, a, a accelerated uh, level, mm -hmm. then the natural transition is to go into acting. Mm -hmm. And so that was always on my checklist. And um, as I'm, you know, making my rounds and just coming up uh, uh, in, 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 my, in my journey, um, Dallas Austin, Mm -hmm. He came and was like, yo, I got this movie I'm doing. I want you to read for it. I said, all right, bet. Uh, 
He said, but you got to learn how to play the drums. I said, huh? Learn how to play the drums? It's acting though, right? <laughs> He's like, nah, you need to learn how to play the drums. I said, man, shh. Nah. But I went and read for it anyway. Uh, and that was Drumline. I didn't get that one. Mm -hmm. and, you know, some nigga named Nick Cannon came. It's a go Yeah, I mean. <laughs> uh, but, but, but the next movie he had, off of the success of Drumline, gave him an opportunity to do uh, his second piece. And after Drumline, I walked up to him in the club. I say, hey, nigga, I ain't reading for the next one. You're gonna have to go and give me the role. I ain't, you know. But this is like, while I'm kind of, you know, I, I, I'm feeling myself a little bit, you know, I got my chest out. And he say, all right, cool. When I get a script and everything, we get a green lit, don't even trip. You got it. And um, that, 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 that film was at the time called Jelly Beans after the skating rink in the Swatch in the in, uh, late 70s and 80s. And I believe some kind of way it got into the hands of Will Smith. Will Smith and Overbrook, uh, as a production company, came in and kind of like green lit it. And um, Dallas had always said, yo, Tip is supposed to be the star of this. Because I think a lot of people don't know, but that's, that's like Dallas's story. Mm -hmm. As I mean, him and T-Boss yeah. from TLC. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I believe T-Boss was new, new, if I ain't mistaken. Okay. And Dallas was for sure, I mm -hmm. believe. You know, it's just uh, folklore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> urban legend, if you urban will. Urban legend. <laughs> so, Dallas had already said, yo, this is supposed to be Rashad, but I'm a first-time actor. And no major movie studio gives a first-time actor the, 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 you know, the responsibility of carrying a lead role. And we had a first-time director in Chris Robinson. Um, so they were pushing back, man, now nah, we need to find somebody a little more seasoned, a little more poised. And, and Will Smith said, well, if he's not going to play for sure, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to produce the movie. Hmm. So Will came in and really, really put his, you know, he put his, he put his, his reputation on the line for me to be Rashad in ATL. So that was my introduction into film. Mm. So what, I almost got fired the first four days. I almost got fired. First four days? Man, it almost, did, it almost did not happen because I, so, okay. Now, mind you, it's my first film. I'm a first-time actor. And, I, and I'm pretty new to... I guess show business all together. But I'm coming into a certain level of success. I, I think I might have made 85000 130000 to do ATL. I had just got a $10 million check. Mm. And then another $5 million check. And I'm like, I'm pulling up. I remember we had these, these roller skate lessons, like practices, like a, you know, every... That for six weeks before we started shooting, we had to learn how to skate and shit. Man, I'm coming late, blowing, blowing smoke out of a phantom. And you know what I'm saying? I'm, this is totally not the leadership that they expected <laughs> from, you know the what I'm saying? Actor. From the lead actor mm -hmm. of this film. And when we started shooting, you know, film, the, 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 the film industry has to work promptly, on time. You got to show up on time. You got to be prepared. You got to be ready because it's not just you. It's a whole crew, mm -hmm. a team of people that got to show up and be focused and be on time in order for this to, to, to be achieved. And so I show up 45 minutes late. Like, man, shit, I show up to a concert 45 minutes late. That's, little, that's pretty much on time. Mm -hmm. Man, he's like, yo, so we're going to fire you, right? <laughs> and we just going to reshoot everything. And my first thing was, fuck it, fire me. I don't care. And um, Chris Robinson came and saw me. And he said, bro, listen. And Chris Robinson also shot my first video, I'm Serious, with Beanie Man. Mm -hmm. So we had a rapport. He said, bro, this not just you. This me. I'm a first-time director. You got other first-time actors like, like Evan Ross, Diana Ross's son. Mm -hmm. He's, and you know, Will, first-time producer. So 
we're going to need you to show up, man, and, and, and we're going to need you to lead us to the finish line. And so I kind of, you know, I started looking at it a little different. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I had a real individual mentality going into it. Uh, but after that conversation with Chris and Charlie Mack, mm -hmm. by the way, also Charlie Mack, after having those conversations, it, 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 I felt a different sense of responsibility. You know what I mean? I felt like I felt like I was responsible for the success or the failure of mm -hmm. the film. Yeah. And, you know, I was on time from that day forward. Um, funny thing about ATL that you probably don't know, the ending was totally commandeered by me, Chris Robinson, Evan Ross, Lauren London, totally not what's on, you will not find a script for the end of that movie. You, if you look at the script for what well, the script was entitled Jelly Bean, but if you look at that script, at the end of that script, the movie was supposed to be by me making up with my friends and going back to win a skate competition. And we saw the film, and the first thing I said, I said, Chris, this ain't shit. Somebody give a fuck about no goddamn skate competition, man. What's going on? You got real shit going on. What about the boy? What about Evan and, and the money that he owed mm -hmm. Big Boy? What the mm -hmm. fuck? What, that's the story. That's, that's the, the uh, how can I say, the gravitas that you need to pull in the people of the community that this story is supposed to represent. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, we're going to go back to that one. <laughs> Grab what? a toss. Substance. The substance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so of course, you know, we we we. Well, first thing he said, well, man, the studio never approved. I say, well, shit, let's get it done. So what we did was, well, and please don't do this. This is not a fair. This is not good practice. Don't do this. Um, but what we did was. Well, told the studio we were doing reshoots for the scenes that already existed. So they set up the days for the reshoots and we just totally Good redid job, the man. end of the movie. The shit where he walk out and spill the milk when I throw the money in Big Boy's yeah. face, him getting shot, going to the hospital, all that was totally off script. Warner Brothers had no idea. They seen the movie, they say, how fucking dare you take our fucking money and do what you want. And, you know, I just hid behind Chris, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah. hey, is it good, though? It worked out. You know what I mean? They said they'd be happy if they made $8 million off of ATL total. I think we did like 14, 16 million the first week. Mm -hmm. But the audacity of right. us First time, to go too. make this movie a better movie mm -hmm. without their consent, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> little fun fact. 07, American Gangster with Denzel. Mm. What that's like? What was that like? Big school. That was big school. With your big boy pants on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was big school, man. That was intimidating. Intimidating, like, like kind of like, damn, me? You sure? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, Russell Crowe, Rizzo, uh, directed by Ridley Scott. Yeah. Same motherfucker did Gladiator. Mm hmm For real? Me. Mm -hmm. Denzel, Common, uh, Chuatel, uh, Ruby D. You know what I'm saying? So many legendary, Cuba Gooden Jr. Yep. So many legendary actors and actresses that, that were called upon, and I was included. I was a little overwhelmed. I ain't gonna cap you down. I remember, I remember the first, well, the scene that I was supposed to be doing with Denzel, um, where we sitting outside in the yard, I wanna be like you, Uncle Frank. You was throwing the baseball. Yeah, well, actually, well, I, they cut from me, like, catching the baseball, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I sit down, and we go through it like a little rehearsal. And then, you know, while they setting up the cameras and shit, I'm pacing back and forth, you know what I mean? I'm like talking to myself and shit. And then Zell say, hey, 
What's up, nigga? You nervous? <laughs> <laughs> I say, shh, man, kind of, bro. I just, I just don't want to fuck it up. Just don't want to fuck it up. No, for real. You say, fuck it up. You say, hey, listen, let me tell you something. Look around. They could have had anybody do what you're doing right now. They could have put anybody in this position. Mm -hmm. They could have put anybody right here. Couldn't they? Mm -hmm. I say, yeah. He said, they chose you, didn't they? I say, yeah. He said, do you know why? Do you know why they chose you? I said, yeah, I think so. He said, okay, well, if you know why they chose you, get your ass in there and do that. You ain't got nothing to be nervous about. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after that, we went in there and did the, you know, did the scene. And I think we one took it. I think it was like one take and a safety. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But he really, really spoke. Man, he spoke life into me at the time, because for him to even look at me out of eye and, you know what I'm saying, respect mm -hmm. my craft enough and respect, you know, me enough as an actor. Especially this was when a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of formal, or should I say, first trade actors were looking at rappers who get movies kind of mm -hmm. like, oh, man. Sideways. You know what I mean? Uh, so for him to even take the time to pour into me and give me some game right then, that took me a long way. How hard, you know, you've been in comedy now, how hard were you laughing <laughs> on set with Will Ferrell and Kevin Hart, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't keep a straight face, man. At I all. ain't lying. I couldn't keep a straight face. I probably would have been in the movie a lot more if I wasn't laughing yeah. when the camera was on me so much. You know what I'm saying? Uh, man, you can't. Kevin Hart funny. He can't. He can't not be funny. Right. You know what I mean. Just him. And Will Ferrell, same thing, man. You get these motherfuckers together, then that shit was just hilarious. Now, it was a lot of shit that they did on days where I wasn't there. When I saw the movie, I was like, God damn, what the fuck? But you know, <laughs> <laughs> pushing the limits is what you know. They what do. That would make comedy. That would make it great. Yeah. Um, but that was a phenomenal opportunity that, that, that Kevin Hart pretty much, man, he pretty much just ushered me into that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, he said, man, this guy, this guy right here, this is you all day. I just need you to come and be you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. like, all right, cool. Let's do it. I was around a little bit around the time BMF was here. Your assessment. was a magical moment. Man, I'm talking about great years. What's magical. your assessment on... Um, BMF 50 Cent. How accurate is that to you? How what? Accurate. How accurate? Well, well, listen, first of all, I'm looking and learning about A the days too. before I met me. Mm -hmm. I, ain't, I, I wasn't in Detroit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I remember him as like, you know, one of the first niggas who had a Bentley mm -hmm. in, in the city. You know what I'm saying? Or a, a Rover, I don't remember. But he had, you know what I'm saying? He was just, I always known as a quiet motherfucker who had, you know, had the paper. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what happened before he made it to Atlanta. Yeah. So presently, right now, what I'm seeing is teaching me. Yeah, I'm a lot you know, gaining it. a different level of understanding mm -hmm. and a different level of appreciation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I, I, I think, you know, you can't say enough uh, about 50 for putting his name his uh, reputation, relationships together on behalf of somebody like Meech. Mm -hmm. And even to, to take the opportunity to pour into Lil Meech. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the biggest part. To pour into Lil Meech and, and put him, again, first time actor, leading role. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of trust. Yeah. That's a lot of trust. That's a lot of risk. You know what I mean? And to make it work the way that it is, that it's been wildly successful is... It's, you know, I think that's commendable. Yeah, that's commendable big. at the least. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you and your wife both obviously public figures. Uh, you made mm -hmm. a decision as a family to do the reality TV thing, and I had a small taste of that and realized once you open that book, mm. there ain't no shutting it. Everything is judged and scrutinized. Mm -hmm. What was your biggest takeaway from actually letting people all the way in? Well, see, the first thing is yeah, right. Okay, so. Us both being celebrities, you know, it's hard to enjoy the union when you're married to another celebrity. 
did. I always remind you they were famous before you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I was getting that bag it's before you. Di- it's difficult to really enjoy it, you know. <laughs> um, and to be honest with you, man, Family Hustle, the concept, it was kind of conceptualized while I was in prison. The second time. Um, so I was real kind of like kicking myself in the ass when I went back to prison the second time. I was real, you know, you could hear on like the album No Mercy. I was like, man, shit. I was really discouraged. How long was you in there for? I ain't do but yeah. 11 months. Yeah, I did 11 months. 10 months the first time, 11 months the second time. So, but I was real discouraged yeah, because I got out. My first bid dropped Takers. That was tough. Number one movie, uh, Beat Out the Exorcist. Number one film in the country. Had just got married. Didn't even get a chance to go to a honeymoon because I had to, you know, do press for takers. Mm-hmm. Opened it to number one film in the country. And in the midst of the celebration for being the number one film in the country, get pulled over with a goddamn pill in my pocket. And I had no idea that motherfucker. I don't, how in the fuck did a pill appear in my fucking pocket? <laughs> a loose pill, you know a what I'm saying? One pill. fucking pill. Had I known that pill, that would have yeah. threw that motherfucker on back. We would have had, you know, a different conversation. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I mean, man, you know, I think it was, it was the universe sitting me down because I needed to learn. I needed, to, I needed, I needed some quiet time. Uh, and I needed, I needed to to train myself in a different aspect uh, of my life, um, and that's what that's what ended up happening. Uh, so when I was when I went back to prison the second time, it was just very tumultuous, if you will, um, it was difficult. Okay. At virtuous. Tumultuous. This <laughs> nigga's crazy. Yep. Um, and we just needed, I would just notice like everything that was written about me was only being written about like small indiscretions. Like I probably had done, had years and years of community service, giving back trying to, you know what I'm saying, uh, mentor the youth, you know, just just doing everything I can to kind of, you know, community development with with new finished constructions and whatnot. And everything that was being spoken about about me during that time was all about indiscretion this time and indiscretion last time. So we felt like, man, we need to put something else on people's minds. Mm-hmm. So um, Chris Abrego, uh, and my and my uh, agent manager at the time, they came and saw me, and it was like, "Yo, we already got the show sold. We just need you to say yeah." And I'm like, "Yeah, but what's the show? What's this?" Like, man, we just just going you. How you balance being a family man and a and a and a businessman and a you know a musician and I'm like, all right, cool. We still didn't know what the show was. It wasn't until. Well, first, they, they, so they picked me up from prison in a bus, and I got sent back to prison because they said I wasn't supposed to leave in a tour bus. Mm. Mm. You know, I did two weeks. It wasn't, I was I, I still locked up, no matter where you put me. Mm-hmm. But when we got home and, and when they saw Tamika and how, you know, how much of a star she was, when they saw uh, Major, how much of a star he was. That first episode where he said, get in the bed, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And I was like, man, I didn't even know Major to be this animated. Like, and I learned a lot of my kids because there are times where they would be shooting their own scenes and they would talk just like, you know, brother and sister, brother and brother talking. And I'm like, I don't even know the, this, this side <laughs> of them. And when, when the people saw it, they became the stars at that point. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that's when we knew what the show was. The show is about the family. Mm-hmm. I just happened to be in the family. You know, <laughs> it's almost like me fighting. Hey, I'm 
a big deal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're like, yeah, 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 sit your head down. Right. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So that's what the show became. Um, but, but, you know, over the course, you know what I'm saying? I think, man, I don't regret it because it documented a time like most people don't get a chance to right. document their children growing up, like, mm-hmm. like season that. after season after season after season. That's a hell of a photo, family photo album. You know what I mean? How many seasons you guys do with that? Not to cut you 13, off. I think. Mm. Yeah, I think 13. So I, I, I don't regret it, but I do, you know, I do recognize the, the cons of the pro. Mm. You know what I mean? I do. See, when motherfuckers be in your business, Constantly. All the way, you know what I'm saying? Live. People you don't even know say, hey, what made you? Because that's my favorite. I'm like, okay, thank you, you know? And, and it was time me and my wife be going through stuff. Old lady say, listen, get back with your, with your family. <laughs> Mind your business, lady. Yeah. With you. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but I guess it take a village. You Absolutely. Did. So, you know what I'm saying? That shit, but that, all in all, it beat the air mattress. Mm, nah, man, no straight up. Yeah, man. Fatherhood. Your kids taking their journeys and, and, and seeing and, and learning, and obviously you, you and your wife working hard so that you could provide a, a better upbringing for them. Mm-hmm. Explain your journey with each of them, because it's been, again, well-documented. And I remember the one time, was it, what was, did you do it on social media where you caught Major smoking a joint in the spa the first time? Major has not smoked a joint yet mm. that I know of. Who'd you catch in the spa, was, you thought? That was King. King. Oh, was it King? No, yeah, King. He said nothing. No, no, I hope Major ain't smoking <laughs> I mean, Yeah, nah, right, nah, King. No, nah, Major. Nah, Major too young. <laughs> Whew. Yeah, that's what I meant. King, my bad. Yeah. Man, was that on your social like media, though? Bricks. Yeah, but see, what happened was we was on vacation, right? Okay. And so well, what I was talking about during that live was these rich kids, they all they do is, you know, live off the fat of the land. They ain't got to, they ain't got to work for nothing. And he happened to have been with his shirt off like Scarface in a jacuzzi. <laughs> right. It was perfect you know what I'm saying? timing, like, right. Kickback, yep. Like he done paid for everything. <laughs> it's and his house. I went to show him being in the jacuzzi and this nigga smoking the joint. <laughs> yeah, yo, I was sorry, ah. I ain't even smoking. It's lit. Too. You I'm know what I'm about. saying? Yeah. And you know, <laughs> you know, I guess the cat was released out that bag that yeah. day. And that's the first time I had ever seen him smoking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, Fatherhood on the fly. Yeah, bro. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think about how I was when I was his age. Twelve times worse. You did. <laughs> you know, and I just, you know, I understand. I think he had some sort of like a survivor's remorse a little bit because he, he, you know, as as affluent and opulent as he grew up, as all the access to relationships, resources, and just, you know, the lifestyle that he grew up, uh, he doesn't want that to precede his true character, his moral. He don't want to lean on, yeah. you know, being celebrity kid. He don't want to lean on living in a mansion and being rich. He's like, like, yo, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand on, I'm gonna stand on my own, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna have my integrity intact, and I want my respect to speak for me, mm-hmm. you know. But I don't know how he got the ops. I don't know how. You know, yeah, just, I, 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 I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but in all fairness, though, with King, though, bro, you know, I love King. And they, all of my children, all seven of them, got a different part of me, a different Didn't piece of my personality. I they, said that earlier. Each of them. And I don't know how it happened like that. Like, each of them, like, almost, almost like the, the time they spent with me, they took the parts of my personality that they felt like applied to them and... And like, you know, well, I don't need the rest of this shit. <laughs> I take this, and you know, if it don't apply, let it fly. Mm-hmm. Um, King, however, he got that dope boys in the trap. Still ain't forgave myself. Tip, you know what I'm saying? He reminds me. Meet of, me at the mirror. <laughs> Meet me at the mirror. He remind me of myself during the time in my life I made the most mistakes I could have ever possibly mm. made, and I love him. Uh, I respect his heart. Um, I just, I'm worried about him, 
because it's three things King do, man. When I say King gonna have trouble on his hand, it's three things he do that worry me. One, travel with a pack of niggas. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Mm -hmm. And he the only rich one in, well, actually now with him and Tootie. Tootie. You know, now Tootie at least Rock. now. I, him and Tootie I feel, Rock. I feel a little bit better. But you know, me and Boosie still got and bump our heads against the wall. We have never been as close. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now that we got to get them collaborate on how to deal with these <laughs> little bad motherfuckers. But so he run with a pack of niggas. He talk so much all the time. You hear him before you see him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he don't listen to nothing. Out of spite, if you tell him, if you tell him do it this way, he gonna do it that way just to show you that it could be done. Mm -hmm. And those three things scare me the most about him. You know what I mean? But, you know, through the grace of God, I think we gonna get past it. Mm -hmm. We'll get through it. Because mm -hmm. I seen a motherfucker who was way worse than him make it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Be good. Stack got to share a moment with his daughter at the, the George Floyd March out here in Atlanta. Uh, you were a part of that. Uh, can you guys elaborate on what that experience was like? <sighs> the money was with you that day. Yeah, yeah. That's what really got me kind of in the social activism. Like when my daughters and my sons like, but dad, what does this mean? Like why? I ain't really got no answers, you know what I mean? And, and cause I remember Damani, that same March, Damani said, well, what can we do? Mm -hmm. What can we do? I said, shit, we speak out, we, 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 we just rebel. And he say, how? I said, well, there's a march going on now. You want to go? He said, yeah. So we pulled over Centennial Park, got in the mm -hmm. mix. That's how it happened, you know what I mean? And then after the march, we marched all around and shit. Then we came back to Centennial and sat on the bench. Mm -hmm. And then the whole crowd looked at me. All right, Tip, what's next? What's next? Nigga, I'm shit. I just, I'm marching just like y'all marching. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then that, you know, that kind of, you know, just, you know, turn, start spinning my wheels and like, man, if people looking to me for what's next, I got to at least start thinking about it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and speaking out, using my influence, using the platform that has been, that I've been blessed with to uh, be a voice for the voiceless, you know what I mean? And, and that's really what started. And I'm gonna tell you what got me out of it. Um, seeing how many of the people you're actually fighting to try to help, mm. how many of them are willing to go above and beyond to destroy you? I ain't worried about the enemy. I'm not worried about the enemy. I already know what the enemy is capable of. I expect the enemy to be as treacherous, deceitful, and, and, and you know, as dastardly as they could possibly be. They've shown time and time again what they're capable of. I'm expecting that. But the motherfucker standing next to me, mm -hmm. to my left, to my right, you know what I mean, who would rather destroy me to please the enemy then assist me in overthrowing or assist me in, in you know, trying to bring about change. Um, man, that shit is, that, that, that was really discouraging. You know what I mean? That shit really hurt. So I just pulled back. I'm, you know, I just mind my business now. Yeah, I mean, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because, you know, a lot of the times when you speak up with people, it's like my experience with Georgia, I didn't ask to be in that position. Right. I didn't ask to have to see my friend murder, you know, for the right. world to see. But at the same time, I did something that a lot of people didn't have the guts to do. Now, when you have success at things like that, mm. it's a lot of people, and I'm gonna tell you why they mad at you. One, is some people hustle. Mm. They prey on stuff like that to go down there and benefit off people's pain. Mm. See, we didn't do that. We right. did it because our hearts, we want to do what's right. right. That's a lot of people hustle. So when you show up and get all the attention mm. and, and it ain't no money involved, you're doing it out your heart, mm. it's taken out of their pockets. Mm. So that's some people hustle. Two, people only hate what they can't be and what they can't do. 
Mm. So if you able to go to a march and leave people happy but follow you for the right cause, people envy that because ain't nobody following them. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that's the two things I've seen. They envy what they can't be, bro. Well, I mean, I, I've learned that the for the most part, what people feel about me is usually a reflection of them. Mm. It's very little, has very little <laughs> to, to actually do, do with you. With me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. It's about what they've been exposed to, um, what they expect of themselves, mm -hmm. their fears, their failures, their insecurities. Um, and that just gets projected onto me, you know, by way of conversation or, you know, just, just, just hate, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, and, and my understanding of that, my understanding of that allows me to kind of just see it and don't see it, bro. You know what I mean? Cause I went from a time where I wasn't letting nothing slide. I ain't want nothing getting by. I ain't, I'm at it. Everything it is to be at, I'm at. And I learned that no matter how many victories or how many successful battles you endure and overcome, it's gonna, they just gonna keep coming. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna keep coming, it's just gonna keep coming. So at the end of the day, man, for real, you have to protect your peace at a certain point in time. You feel me? So I just, man, I, man, fuck them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to I commend you, bro, because like I said, I know, I know it ain't easy, but I commend you for taking a stand and, and being selfless in situations like that. <clears throat> um, reflect on your career. Mm. Any advice you would give somebody? Because you've been able to have longevity. A lot of people die and, 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 and would give anything to go back to be able to say they had longevity in anything. You've been successful in multiple things and still going. Um, what advice would you give somebody? Um, first of all, don't do it like I did it, because that shit might not work for you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got you got you got your own journey that you gotta you gotta walk your own walk. You know what I mean? There is no monolithic path to success. Mm -hmm. um, learn, listen, you know what I mean? Accept the opportunity to grow and evolve. Don't, don't, don't pigeonhole yourself to, to, to having to remain, you know, any particular way for any particular group of people. Yeah. Man, just learn grow, evolve, and you got one or two options. You can either pull them up or let them pull you down. Ain't no in between, you feel me? Surround yourself with people that's just as, that's just as hungry and eager to learn, eager to succeed as you are. And don't let nobody talk you out of your vision because they can't see it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, that the biggest mistake I ever made in this shit. You know what I mean? Because, you know, we all have visions. Each and every last one of us, every human being on earth has a purpose and, 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 and has a vision or, or something that they can contribute. It comes to us first by way of a vision. Mm -hmm. Something that you see in your mind, an idea that you have, nobody else had it, it's yours. And the first thing we usually do it go to our peers and, and, and go to our, 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 the people around us and tell them of our vision. And because they don't have the same vision or they don't believe that they could achieve properly executing this vision. They first thing, they say, no, nah, man, you can't do that. What you won't do that for, man? Ain't nobody did. And the first thing we do it like, damn, that might be a dumbass idea. Let me mm -hmm. just... And then... A year later, you'll see another motherfucker that just done got done shot through the roof doing the exact same thing that you just said. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and that's the thing that I regret the most about my career. Just, just being so, I guess, so, so <clears throat> sharing my vision with other people who projected their fears and failures on me and allowed myself to not do what the universe showed me mm -hmm. I was supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? But that lesson I've carried into, you know, I've, I've been able to do it right. Mm -hmm. 
this next phase or, or and, and passion of yours, comedy. Ooh. Speak to us about the ups and downs, what you've learned, what you love, your drive for it. Man, uh, okay, so what I've learned is people, like, take me very literal. And, like, you know, everything I say, motherfucker take it very serious. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm really, I guess a motherfucker would have to really spend some time around me to see, you know, I'm a pretty, careful, like, I, I joke and, and trip. That's kind of how we get through a lot of the shit that, I have a very dark sense of humor sometimes. Uh, I think my first stand-up set, <laughs> unofficially, was at my sister Precious funeral, you know, and everybody was hurting, everybody was in pain, everybody was, you know, going through it. And I, and I was summoned to speak. And so the first thing I said, well, what we ain't finna do is be in here sad and, and miserable and because that ain't what she represented. And secondly, pressure, we got all of Popsies mistresses and women and everybody in here, <laughs> so we already having to go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And everybody just died laughing, because that's probably the only time. Because, you know, my pops ain't never been married, you know what I'm saying? I got six sisters, one little brother, and all of his children's mamas was there, and they had never been nowhere in the same building at the same time. <laughs> so I said, Precious, you did it. You did the impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I, you know what I'm saying, I, I mean, I have a pretty healthy sense of humor, but people, you know what I'm saying, take everything I say to be literal. Everybody can't take it. Yeah, I learned that. Uh, but it didn't do nothing but just, you know what I'm saying, push me to go, to go harder about it. Uh, and I also learned that, you know, comedy is, is very sacred. It's a lot of people who suffer and don't ever get they just do. It's a lot of accolades that people don't receive, and you could do it for a lifetime. You got motherfuckers who are masters at the craft, who deserve every every chance to be in every spotlight that there exists for this for this uh, area entertainment. And people really take it personally when motherfuckers just getting up there like, yeah, yeah, I could do this, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, so I learned to respect it a whole lot. I, I, I always had a respect for the people who did it, but I learned that there must be an equal amount of respect as I do it, you know? Um, and it's, it's therapeutic. It's therapeutic. There's a freedom that where I can get up here and, you know, talk about whatever I'm going through in my day. If I do a song, you know what I mean? If something happened to me today, I record a song, go to the studio, I gotta mix it, master it, shoot a video. It'll be five, six weeks before you actually hear what I, what I got on my mind. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Whereas if something happened to me today, I can hit a comedy club and I can, you know, I can goddamn get it off my chest right now. Life mm -hmm. at your pain. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think initially, you know, there's a lot of criticism and speculation. He ain't even funny. I don't see him like that. What he doing up there? Well, the thing is, the crowd is gonna tell you immediately whether you're supposed to be up there, you know? Uh, so I just, man, do the best I can to speak from my heart and talk about shit that everybody can relate to mm -hmm. and find humor in that. You know I mean? went to one of your first shows, man, Wifey, with uh, Where? The, your first shows with Ha Ha Mafia. Okay. And um, what, what city? It was here in Atlanta. Remember, I saw you outside. I was walking in. We, what, we, we, what venue? Uh, do you remember the venue, babe? It was, it was a hole in the wall. Mm. It was a hole in the wall. And it, it was the first one DC did itself. Okay, got you. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yes. and I saw you outside. Yes. I was walking in. You yes. did a great job to say that was one of your first times, bro. Man, so thank you. I take my hat off to you. Man, thank you. I appreciate it, man. It's just getting better and better. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the, my favorite show thus far, though, is Brooklyn. Barclays, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Everybody told me I was gonna get booed eventually. Like, everybody was like, yo, it's gonna happen. You're gonna get booed, it's gonna happen. Just be ready. I'm like, man, everybody finna boo me. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and it happened, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but them motherfuckers were waiting to get me somewhere to boo me for a long time, yeah, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Uh, but we shared a moment, you know, myself in, in New York. All five boroughs came together and could agree 
in that moment at that time, man, boo this nigga. <laughs> you know. Uh, but I enjoyed it so much. I enjoyed it so much. Uh, and then the very next, so after I got off stage, I got a lot of calls from everybody. You know what I'm saying? Uh, everybody from Donnell Rollins to K Dub to. You know, Donnell Rollins, Ashley Larry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to to uh, uh, Marlon Wayne's, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, hey man, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm straight. What's up? Man, I'm just saying, Mar the first thing Marlon said was, man, leave the arenas alone, man. <laughs> Stick to the small rooms, <laughs> man. I said, man, they gave me $30,000. It was my yeah. first paid gig yeah. as a camera. He said, they set you up, nigga. Can't you see it? <laughs> and so, you know, my hard-headed ass, I went right back to an arena, came right to Atlanta the next day. You know, on the uh, No Cap tour with DC mm -hmm. and, and Duval and D-Ray, and talked about getting booed the day before, and got a standing ovation. And killed, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that when motherfucker was like, "Yo, you're a real comedian now." You know what I'm saying? Now you done took the lumps and bumps. You mm -hmm. know. But that was my favorite show. I enjoyed it. So thank you, Brooklyn. You learn from it. Quick hitters. Quick hitters. Almost finished. First thing to come to mind. Let us know a show or movie you could watch on repeat. Mm. Present day or past? Whatever you want. Whatever. Show a movie I could watch on repeat. Life. Mm hmm If you could remember one lyric or bar, what would it be? Your favorite lyric or bar? My favorite lyric or bar? Well, just give me this. I'm going to change the question. Okay. If you could put one of your favorite bars on the billboard, what would it be? My favorite? Coming from yours? Me? Yeah, if you could pick a bar. Um... Mm. Uh, it'll probably be To Play Me, Baby. Hey, he gonna need a track from God featuring Jesus and Jay-Z. Jay-Z, yeah, yeah. It'll probably be that one. If you needed more, all we had to do was call Monte Ellis. Shit. <laughs> sure. just, just anything by him? Mm -hmm. Y'all, man, Monte used to go crazy, man. I appreciate I'm that. I'm illy as his shit. I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, that. We had Mike on the show, and he told us about one of his favorite stories one time uh, about you and him in the, in the, in the studio with Kobe. Mm, Killer yeah. Mike. Yes. Any Kobe stories? Man, that one. So, you know, Kobe was here. He was playing the Hawks, you know. Uh, and, and Kobe and my, my manager at the time, G. Robeson, real, real tight. So while he was in the city, um, G brought him over to the studio. And I just happened to be in there with Mike at the time. And um, me, you know, just again, fucking with Kobe, you know, just cause. I said, man, don't take this ad whipping personal now. You know, I don't want to fall out with you about this ad whipping we feel to put on you. And, you know, of course, he came back and grand. Kobe's like, oh, yeah, you believe that? <laughs> 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 you look so much smarter than that. You know, and, and and we just enjoyed the moment. Had and he listened. I, I think I played um, was it Trouble Man? I think I played the Trouble Man album for him. You know the songs before you know they were released. We vibed that. Me and Mike was smoking big. Kobe was just in that motherfucker trying mm -hmm. not to get a contact. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Uh, and and when he left there, I was like, shit, what you finna do? I said, shit, I finna go to the gym. I mm. said, what? It was two in the morning. Yeah. I say, what? We went to Magic City. Then nigga say he going <laughs> to the gym. Yeah. I say, God damn, this motherfucker's serious, you know? And I just developed a whole uh, a whole nother level of respect for him. Um of course, you can't take anything away from his from his accolades and the things he's achieved. Uh, but just for me to see firsthand the, the level greatness. of commitment mm -hmm. and sacrifice that went into those things becoming possible, it um it was a, it was a joy to behold. Mm, it's beautiful. Uh, five dinner guests, dead or alive? Come on, man. Yeah, five dinner guests, dead or alive. Muhammad Ali, <sighs> Tupac, Harriet Tubman, <laughs> Frederick Douglass. 
Um, Some real thought going behind this. I like it. Mm -hmm. How many of that? That's four. four. That's four. One more. They got to go Mike Tyson, man. Mike, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yo, like, yeah, Mike gonna make sure. That's a hell of a, that's mm -hmm. a hell of a goddamn dinner table, man. Yeah. You feel me? You a lot of mushroom and weed there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Bob Marley, damn. Bob ah, Marley. He can come too. Can come it's your table. Him. Yeah, him and Mike yeah. gonna pull exactly. up one more chair. Malcolm X. There you oh, go, yeah. Yeah, too. Fred Fox. It's a lot. Yeah. Shit. It's a lot now. Man, don't do me big, like that. It's a big lot table. <laughs> All right, if you could have one guest on the show, if you could see one guest on our show, who would it be? One but guest. But before you answer that question, you have to help us get your answer on our show. Mm, the catch. That's Ooh. the catch. So I got to think about somebody who I can actually have some influence There it is. Oh. Indeed. Boosie. Oh, we supposed to have Man, one. Man, I just day. talked to him the other day. <laughs> I just talked to him the other day. That's a good call. Yes, yeah, sir. We got to have Boosie. Yeah, yes, and, Andy got, and he just dropped the movie. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, he you know, movie. and he been, he been in his bag, his independent film production bag. Grinding, yeah. Yeah, man. Getting it out the mud, too. You feel mm -hmm. me? Yeah, and I just, I've just buried my brother in that rocket, man. Help, you know, has been helping mm -hmm. me get through some, time, some tough nights. So, I, man. he dropped that right on time. Right on. Mm -hmm. Well, Tip, man, we appreciate your time. We know you're busy. Uh, job, best bro. of luck in, on, in all aspects of life. You continue to excel in, man, and, and we really appreciate you. We are a fan of, you know, what you stand on, what you stand for. So thank you for your time today. Man, much, much, love much. and respect. Both of you brothers, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's an honor to sit here and just exchange dialogue with y'all. Both of y'all, I've seen both of y'all. Go through some shit. I was like, ooh, I don't know how you gonna do that. <laughs> how you gonna get out of here? Ooh, shit. <laughs> hey, man, the goddamn palace, bro. Like, goddamn, this nigga, this nigga got busy. You hear me? <laughs> and you know what I'm saying, man, you had to exercise uh, uh, so much restraint within. Yeah. <laughs> you A know. couple times. But, 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 but. Had to make exceptions for the exceptional circumstances. Come on, man. To go that I was put in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we ain't gonna, we ain't, we ain't, we ain't, we ain't gonna cross this line. Now, yeah, man. yeah. <laughs> you know, not the gun line, boss. <laughs> you know, so I, I respect. I, I've seen y'all, you know, uh, be tested. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Not necessarily by the world as much as. Tested by yourselves. Mm -hmm. or you had to overcome yourself. Mm -hmm. You had to, you know, you had to really be who you presented yourself to be. And you, you know what I'm saying? And y'all, and you passed it. That's what real motherfuckers are gonna respect. Anybody who do everything per uh, do everything perfect and their life is going perfect. Ain't real. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, relate. you can't relate to it. Anybody can do that. Yeah, can't relate you to it. I mean, can you lose it, get it back, make a mistake, learn from it, be better. And, and move forward with the understanding and the knowledge and the wisdom mm -hmm. that come from that. That's what I respect. So thank y'all. Appreciate that. Here we got some uh, We got some merch for you. All the smoke okay. gear. Appreciate it. Shit, man. Appreciate that. All the smoke that. gear. Well, that's a wrap, man. Got in. Yeah, Tip. you did. All the smoke. Swag. You can catch us on Showtime Basketball YouTube and the iHeart platform, Black Effects. The King Palmer! Yes, See y'all next sir. week. It's official. Miss Patty is back, and nothing is going to stop her dream. I'm going on tour with Tony Free. Except maybe her kids or the new boss. My cousins have arrived, and I promised them a room. I done f***ed out the room yet, Tony. <laughs> them women didn't sound like his cousin. You look like you want to cry. The don't cry, Terry. We water. The Miss Pat Show, season three, streaming February 23rd.